Well, welcome everybody. My name is Jennifer Walinga and welcome to our webinar series on sport leadership and social change. And of course, we're focusing in on women leadership and sport for this few episodes. We'll have one, another one in March of 2021 around Women's Day as well. But we're really lucky today to have uh, Sheila Robertson with us. She was the founding editor of Champion Magazine, 1977. That was Canada's first and only magazine for and about high performance athletes. She's also the founding editor and author for the Canadian Journal for Women in Coaching. I've been lucky enough to have a couple of papers published in that journal and it's been significant in advancing women in coaching in Canada. Sheila Robertson counts herself as a writer and she has lots of uh, great insights into sport in Canada and women in leadership in, in sport in Canada to share today. So I want to welcome Sheila Robertson. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's a and pleasure Sheila, to be here. Oh, thanks so much. It's great to see you too. And so Sheila's in uh, Ottawa, Ontario and uh, had a couple of inches of snow. I'm out here and sorry, it's very sunny here in Victoria, BC. I uh, really appreciate you spending some time with us. So I'd like to start by taking us back to 75, 1975. What do you think were the main challenges facing women in sport? Well, they were, um, it was an interesting time and uh, certainly very different from the way it is nowadays. What I do find interesting, and this has happened quite often, is young women working today uh, in particular at the National Sport Association level, often comment on how tough it is to make it to senior levels in sport administration. Few seem to realize how much has changed since 1975 when I began to work in sport. Then I was just thrilled to have what to me was a dream job, uh, even though it was um, only a nine month contract and I had no idea that it would I would spend the rest of my life in this environment. Um, so I was hired then as information officer for the Canadian Amateur Swimming Association. That was in October 1975. Um, that would eventually lead, of course, that was just before uh, the Olympic Games were going to be staged in Montreal. So you can imagine uh, the excitement. At that time, there was one other woman who had a similar position with another sport organization. And that was about it. As I said, mine was a nine month contract, but uh, stuff happened. And here I am four decades later, still working in sport and grateful for every moment of my unplanned career. So looking uh, back on that time has been an interesting exercise. I, I remember it, it's hard to imagine that it's over four decades ago. I don't know, I mean, people often say, where's the time gone? But that's certainly true in my case. But at the time, the, realis the realistic situation was that opportunities over and above the stereotypical roles of the time were few and focused on positions in administrative support, a read secretary, and a few women in technical roles, but often or generally as assistants to men. I would say that opportunity was the main challenge. Um, and although women were breaking out of traditional roles, support was the last bastion of male domination. Of course, some say it still is, particularly in the coaching environment. It's important, I think, to know at the time that the women's liberation movement was in full bloom, and I certainly was part of that. And it's also at the time when the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women and Sport and Physical Activity, better known to most of us as CAUSE, was formed. I believe there was a correlation given that many women in sport, notably in the academic world, were feminists and activists. At the time, the sport specific issues included, uh, as I said, a woeful lack of opportunities, minimal access to facilities, failure to recognize female athletic achievements, despite the fact that at the Olympic level, Canadian women athletes have routinely produced outstanding medal winning performances as far back as the early days of the games. And that's in both winter and summer sports, I should add. Those early days are often referred to as the golden age for women's sport in Canada because of a dramatic increase in opportunities, participation, and public and media interest. And I should also note there was corporate supports, notably for the women's softball teams of the day. But this upward movement floundered when the, uh, excuse me, when the depression hit and later World War II. 
just as an aside, talking about the, the golden age, I find it sad, perhaps is the best word, that so many people are, are completely unaware of the amazing women athletes who were um, front and center in those days and, and who have the headlines to prove it. So it's kind of interesting how that happened and then slipped away. By the time World War II ended, women's athletic achievements were either ignored altogether or shoved to the back pages of the country's new newspapers. Certainly they rated little attention on television, which was of course in its infancy at that time, uh, but even later on. And too often the focus was on their attire and certainly not their performances, which leads me to sexuality, sexual orientation, and the male coach, female athlete, excuse me, the male female athlete relationship was of a concern, but not sufficiently to prompt action to address and redress abuses which abounded. As did stereotypes, not least about the physical capabilities of women athletes. And we all, I'm sure, are familiar with the story or the myth that um, if women competed at a certain level, like a marathon or rowing, dare I say, um, that they would be unable to have children. And I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it was certainly held to be true for many, many years. And the situation for women in coaching was abysmal. Uh, so far as I can recall, synchronized swimming was a leader in producing outstanding women coaches. Uh, Marianne Reeves and Debbie Muir come to mind, but that was in the late, uh, in the 1980s, uh, not in the period that, which you have asked me about. Um, so that came later. And while these issues were depressing, at the same time, it's important to know that formidable women were breaking ground for those of us who would follow. And I'd like to mention uh, uh, just a few of them. Uh, the late Dr. Mary Keyes, the first woman director of physical education at a Canadian university comes to mind. She was a lovely person and her 38 year career at McMaster University was the stuff of legends. Um, I hope that she, I know that there is a building at the master name for her. So hopefully her legacy lives on. And then there was Dr. Anne Hall of the University of Alberta, an expert on the history of women's sport in Canada and author of a number of excellent books on the subject. Uh, Abby Hoffman, a four-time Olympian in 800 meters. In 1976, she was the first woman to carry the Canadian flag into the stadium at an Olympic Games. Doesn't that sound strange given the many who have done it since, but that was a first. She was an activist and promoter of women in sport, the first woman to serve as Director General of Sport Canada, first woman elected to the Executive, Co uh, Executive Committee of the Canadian Olympic Association, and she continues as a senior member of the Executive Council of the IAAF. She's been in that position for many years. Um, Dr. Helen Lansky, a professor emerita at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, a specialist in equality and gender studies and women in sport, well known for the sharpness of her pen. And I would throw out the uh, question to um, uh, people who are watching this. I wonder how many of you have heard of any of these women. Um, I, I just think that too much of our history has faded away and that's real, excuse me, really a shame because there are many others I could mention, but suffice it to say that there were women leaders who were determined to shatter tradition and give women in sport the voices, positions and opportunities their skills merited. And can I interject there, Sheila? Because you've mentioned too, sure. The phenomenon after post-war where we were breaking ground and there were changes and women were doing some fantastic things in sport uh, the media was noticing the headlines were showing up and then the war happens and then we sort of lose it and we go backwards again to a place where now you know there's this fear we're going to lose our child rearing child bearing uh, capabilities if we play sport or run too hard <laughs> Um, and, you know, we're sexualized all over the place. So what do you think? Because you're right, you know, a lot of these names, I mean, I'm in sports, so I might know some of them, but not all of them. And this has been an amazing education for me in my interactions with you and following, you know, following you, learning about you. Um, what do you think it is? What, what are the factors that contribute to the invisibility or the disappearance or the slipping away of 
these prominent women? Well, I'm not, um, I'm not entirely sure, but from what I've read, from what I have um, studied uh, over the years, because um, my background actually is history of political science, uh, but um, it, it seems that after the war ended, women had, as you probably know, I'm sure you know, had taken on many of the roles that traditionally assigned to men because the men were away fighting. So uh, when they came back, um, and I'm not sure why this happened, uh, probably somebody who was around in that period would have a better idea, but it seems to me women were told to get back into the kitchen. Men had to have jobs and women had held them temporarily. And although they had done extremely well, I mean, there's lovely pictures of women uh, mechanics uh, working on aircraft and, and on and on it goes. Um, there's plenty of opportunities uh, that they, they were given or had to take because, as I say, the men were gone. So it might have been a reversion to tradition after the horrors of war. I suspect that there's some truth in that. Um, and I guess it's spilled over into, uh, into the area of sport. Although, um, and I don't have names at, the, at my fingertips, um, aside from Barbara Ann Scott and figure skating, uh, I, I do believe, but I'd have, to, I'd have to look this up, that there were women athletes who were, were doing well, but it just didn't get the attention. And I think in Canada, uh, until the Montreal Olympics, that remained probably partially true. Um, we did have the 1968 swim team who did well at the Olympics, but Elaine Tanner felt that she was a failure because she only won silver. So, and that was that was a uh, very much a part of the kind of writing that was going on in the media uh, that I believe led her to feel that way. Uh, so, uh, I don't know that I'm answering the question because I'm really not certain of my facts on this. It's just the sense I have that women's uh, women were told to, or it was suggested, or there was the unwritten dynamic that you're, you've had your fun, but the men are back. That's what, that's what I think. Yeah. And the reverting back to tradition, I think those are really valuable insights um, and give us some good ideas about what factors might be contributing and to be on the lookout. Because I do think we spend a lot of time trying to demonstrate that we are capable, but in some ways that might be perceived mm -hmm. threatening, right? And then it almost causes a, an equal and opposite reaction that can be detrimental. So can you tell us more about the time you then went into the National Sports Center in Ottawa and what was it like then uh, for women? Were there many women in those roles of leadership? No, there wasn't. And I mean, I think some of my observations are hindsight. Uh, it didn't take me long to figure it out, but initially when I went there, it was the National Sports Center in Ottawa, which unfortunately does not exist anymore, but is reforming in a different uh, in a different manner today. But at any rate, that was where the national sport organizations, most of them were housed. It was a relatively new uh, concept to have them all together in one place. And I can tell you it was it was exhilarating because people were available. You could, you know, you'd walk down the hall and you could run into or you would run into uh, people in conversations and ideas were exchanged. It was a, it was very interesting for me and I especially because I never thought I'd ever be in such a position. So the thrill was there. Uh, however, uh, there were only a few women who I would call leaders. Uh, I can't think of anyone who was an executive director, uh, a woman in 1975, but there were, uh, I'd like to mention three women. One was Carol Pugliese, who was responsible for amassing an amazing collection of Canadian art with sport as the subject. There were paintings, there were sculptures, there were all kinds of things. Um, just incredible. She did, uh, she was formidable in her uh, desire, her passion for uh, putting this collection together over a number of years. And I knew her quite well. And uh, we actually ended up working together at one time at another part of my career. Then of course there was Carol Ann Leather and who people would, I would hope would know, uh, she became Canada's first female chef de mission. She was 
at the 1988 Seoul Olympics where she managed the Ben Johnson steroid scandal and, and did so ad admirably. That was a really tough situation for her and for the whole country, in fact. Uh, and she was also Canada's first female member of the International Olympic Association. She, sadly, she died very suddenly of a, of a, I believe it was a brain aneurysm, and uh, just just like that, she was gone. Um, there was also Joanne Sinsan, who led the, uh, an organization that has now defunct the Sports Federation of Canada. That was an organization of um, represented all the sport organizations and that was certainly Joanne did a, a good job at that. But I, interestingly, I do not recall being aware of uh, or even sensing that there was a meeting of the minds between these women and the activists. And there was, as far as I know, little of any dialogue. They were sort of on opposite, not sides. It wouldn't, that's too confrontational, but they just didn't communicate different agendas perhaps. I think the environment could be described as uh, every woman for herself in those days. Um, and I don't mean that necessarily negatively. I certainly never personally felt any um, hostility or anything like that from any of the women that I interacted with, but it wasn't collegial. It wasn't uh, supportive. Uh, that's why I say every woman for herself. Now, there was an important thing happened when uh, on the political front, uh, there was action, I would say excitement, certainly I remember this very well, when Iona Campanola was named Minister of State for Fitness and Amateur Sport. Her vision and her impact throughout the late 1970s were immense. And she, um, she was approachable, she was intelligent, she was knowledgeable. I don't want to say she was attractive because that's too often thrown at women, but she was an attractive personality and just uh, just made uh, things so exciting. And that's actually when Champion that you, you mentioned um, was in that period that it began. So she was the first interview we did in the first issue. And later on, of course, there was uh, the feisty Sheila Cox, who was the Minister of Canadian Heritage, which was responsible for sport and is now she was and remains a dynamic advocate for the rights of women. So we were beginning to get role models at a very high level. And I think that had an impact. Now, for me, um, it was certainly a time of, of personal growth. Uh, as mentioned, I had no career plan, but I did learn to take each opportunity as it was, particularly after I stayed on after the nine month contract. Uh, I went to work for, um, or what was known as game plan information. And uh, that was nothing I had ever foreseen, but it happened and, and it was where I was able to house uh, Champion Magazine. So sometimes um, I, I created opportunities. I, I learned to do that. I remember pitching the idea that became Champion Magazine. And I remember with it, a certain shutter winging it in Europe to cover the swim team for CBC Radio and Canadian Press. I had, well, I say little broadcasting experience. I had no broadcasting experience, but I was determined to do the job well because it was an opportunity that I thought could not necessarily lead to things, but could give me even more skills than I was developing. And I certainly was developing them on, on that job. One of the things that uh, was important was the lessons I learned at the 1976 Olympic, Olympic Games where I ended up as a member of the communications team. That team was the first anywhere in sport at that time. It was, there were only four or five of us uh, and we were the liaison for between the sports and, and the media. It was really exciting. Nobody had done it. And here we were. Um, one lesson I did learn is knowing when to quit. There were a lot of um, hangers on, I guess, is the right word, who were there because it was the Olympics and really shouldn't have been there, uh, were there because they had been named once. I, I found that was an important lesson, knowing when to quit. Um, and the daring to dream part of it for me was Champion Magazine. It was something I dreamt up. Uh, I went to um, Roger Jackson, who was at that time the Sport Canada Director General, and 
He said, great idea, let's do it. It was almost that simple. And then I, so I found myself uh, with the athlete information, but what game plan information, which became the athlete information bureau, working with the late Dale Hirsch, who uh, embodied equality in everything he did and just let me run with it. So it was, it was amazing, really, uh, the opportunities that, that sort of just were, I guess falling into my lap is not quite right, but, but for women, it was, it was, it was changing. And I think it's partially because um, there, a Sport Canada established a women in sport program, uh, which was focused on creating, le creating leadership opportunities for women. And that was important for me because my mentor was the visionary Marion Lay, a cause founder who became manager of the women's program at the time. Actually, I established uh, Robertson Communications at her urging and with her support. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, in 1991, I did go out on my own and that was because Marion said, it's time, do it. And something I had never thought of doing, I did and I'm still doing it. So I've always um, been all thrilled that Marion came into my life in such an important way. Um, so the other thing that was happening at that time is more women were becoming uh, consultants at Sport Canada and one of the most important ones was Sue Vale. She was a women's program consultant and she developed effective affirmative action ideas. Um, and I think too that it was, Sport Canada was at that time just a beehive of activity and we can do it kind of attitude. So it was, it was really uh, exciting in so many ways. And I must mention uh, Professor Bruce Kidd, who then and now has always been an outspoken advocate for women in sport. There's no uh, facet of the field that he doesn't know and uh, advocates for constantly. And to this day, he's still uh, a very important member of the women's community. Isn't it great? So that is yeah go ahead and that's what we need right are those um those advocates from male and female and you mentioned earlier and then again when you when you raise the marion lay's uh impact on your life the importance of the bridges between women right and you mentioned earlier around caroline lethran's era that there wasn't as much of a connection they were kind of on on their own really every woman for herself mm -hmm. Then you highlight this oh, amazing relationship that can be built and the support that we can give each other. What would you like to see more of as women work to advance their rights in sport and, and help each other advance into leadership positions? What do you think we need to focus on? Well, I think I think there's a lot more uh, support and interaction. I mean, there's so many women now that um, uh, and there's such a, a recognition, if you look at, I was going to mention later on, uh, current women leaders, do you want me to go to that now? Well, we'll get there, because I don't want to miss all the stuff uh, in between. <laughs> but, you know, uh, what, what do you think, you talked about Marianne providing you this urging and saying the time is now, and are there other, other qualities that we could uh, offer each other or support. I often use this phrase of linking arms a little more often and and advocating for one another. But yeah, anything else that you think has really would would do us proud as women trying to advance in sport? Well, um, I certainly agree with you. But what what comes to mind, and maybe I, maybe I should mention this, um, there was a philosophical bent to why I wanted to do Champion Magazine. And that was because at the, at the Montreal Olympics, there we all had any number of sports, any number of athletes, uh, male and female, um, just think of the rowers. And I, I mean, that was a very strong, very strong team, um, swimming, all, the, all that sort of thing, which is such a whole other discussion. But when the games were over, I was left with the feeling because I interacted with quite a number of the sports. That was our role was to be the liaison, as I said earlier, between um, 
the athletes and coaches and, and the media. And I realized that there was virtually no interaction. I may be stretching the point a bit, but certainly there was minimal interaction between athletes of different teams. And I thought that was wrong. I thought it was a shame. And that was when I began to think, well, if you think like that, what can you, uh, a communications person, do about it? And champion was the, what I came up with. Um, so I, I, had, um, I had a colleague develop a mock-up for me, and I, I went to see Roger Jackson. And as I said earlier, go for it, do it. Because I thought it was really important. And I, I think Champion was, and I'm told that it was, uh, successful in bringing athletes and coaches, but more athletes in this case, uh, together uh, in support and understanding what each was going through, that there were um, commonalities that uh, uh, they could share. You didn't have to be from the same sport. Uh, I think when there were problems, it began to, it began to be people you could go to. So I, I'm, uh, as a communications person, I'm a great believer in communicating. And, and I think that that breaks down barriers uh, either whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in, in larger environments. I mean, I've got a host of, of examples I, I could provide, um, but I don't think the time <laughs> I'm going on as it is. I know, um, But you know, communication and, and sharing, and um, I, if I may, Jennifer, mention one thing that has come into mind um, and that proves my point, I believe, is um, up until a few years ago, I was involved with uh, Sheila Croxon, um, who was you know, one of our best synchronized swimming coaches, in putting on, uh, once a year we would have workshops uh, for national uh, team women coaches. Uh, we went to a lovely place by a lake. Uh, there was a bit of wine, there was food, uh, and there was a lot of talk in a very safe environment. And uh, again, that was just magical to see and watch um, women who were pretty alone in, in their daily jobs as national coaches. Well, you know, you, could, you are sure familiar with some of the problems that they would have run into. Uh, but that few years, I think it ran for six to eight years, uh, that particular one that, that she and I were involved in, um, it was just, it just, convince me if I, as if I needed convincing of the power of women getting together and and becoming friends and and building uh, relationships so I think I think that is and that's why I'm happy that there is a a, um, uh, a smaller version of the National Sports Center being uh, developed in in Ottawa because when people uh, work together uh, it's it's usually, beneficial to all concerned. I love that idea. And I'm working with some students right now to build out, you know, networks of women uh, connecting in sport for different reasons. But we believe if we can build a lot of these little hubs and communities of practice and then connect those up with other communities, you know, it'll all overlap and, and build this beautiful network. I agree. We just need to stay connected and sharing, learning, supporting. So You've, thank you so much. You've given me lots of uh, good memories and uh, documentation of what sport was like, what it was like to work in sport in the late 70s, early 80s. You went on maternity leave, maternity leave in 82, and then you went to Germany for a few years. You kept freelancing. And then what was it like when you returned to Ottawa and the National Sports Center? Um, it was it was really interesting. I had uh, we came back to Canada in '86 and lived for a few years in Toronto, where I began to I'd always stayed in touch with um, some of the people that I've mentioned, um, but I actually did a different sort of work in in Toronto, and then I had the we were able to come back to Ottawa, which we really wanted to do, and uh, coincidentally. Uh, a, the, this small company that was housed in the National Sports Center, which had moved, uh, wasn't uh, wasn't in the same location, uh, but and it was still the same concept. Uh, so, anyways, I became the communications director uh, for this company that specialized in sport, um, and 
it was amazing. Uh, a sea change had occurred. Walking through those halls uh, were woman after woman after woman, and they were there uh, support. They were there as leaders, as executive directors, many, many of them, at least to me. Uh, now, there was some always grumbling about not enough, but for me, because I could, I could contrast the two scenarios, this was really uh, a sign of, of progress. And um, it especially uh, energized me when one of my portfolios was cause. Uh, and again, uh, um, Marion Lay uh, encouraged and supported me and, and I became the cause communications person, served on their board for a little while, but then took the, uh, the professional uh, position with them. And it was a time of growth, cause was rebuilding and um, yeah, I mean, things just couldn't have been more exciting. Mary lays on my roster of people I'd like to have on the webinar as well. And uh, she's had a huge influence on me as well. I wonder if she understands how many people she has impacted, hey, in, in the world of sport. I hope so. We should tell her. I think it, I think it would be wonderful if, um, if you had her on. She, um, she's living more quietly nowadays, but she, we stay in touch and uh, usually if I get out to our daughter in the Squamish, I make a point of trying to see Marion, but that's all stopped right now. So, um, and it's a good reminder for me to check in with her. Uh, she, I can't stress how much of an impact she has had over the years. She has an amazing ability to um, create and then deliver. She comes up with the ideas and then she finds the people. For, for me, she found I was the person in communications. She's found others in all the niches that were needed to be filled in, in women's issues. And so she, just to watch her mind work and listen to her speak um, and then see what happened. I mean, she will say, and I think actually on the there is on the journal uh, website, you mentioned the Canadian Journal, um, uh, a profile I did of her and she talks about how her, her mind works and, and how she gets these ideas and then gets the people to implement it. She doesn't consider herself to be an implementer, she's an ideas person. She's extraordinary. So I, I think you would really, that would be an excellent, an excellent webinar to have Marianne. Uh, well, I will pursue her. <laughs> So next, I've got another question for you. What would you say, uh, in what ways would you say the issues that we're facing women in sport have, have influenced or shaped your career? Well, I my circumstances were somewhat different. I was pretty well the only, that's all changed now, but at the time, uh, women doing communications, there, there, were, there were men, um, but, uh, but I was on a par with them, so it wasn't really, uh, I was aware of the issues though. So although I was never held back from developing my own career, there I can't think, and I, I was thinking about this over the weekend, uh, I can't think of an instance um, where I was held back because uh, I, I'm a woman or for any other reason. So, but I was always acutely aware of the issues that women face, both as athletes, administrators, coaches, and, and later on, um, particularly as I wrote more and more about coaches. Uh, and I always tried to champion change through my writing, especially as the founding editor of Coaches Report. That was in 1991. Uh, and that, that, being the editor of that publication, um, for many years, I was able to showcase the extraordinary women coaches who were making names for themselves. And uh, I was proud of that. Uh, nobody ever told me not to do it. I just, mm -hmm. we, we just did it. And there were the women to, to showcase. Uh, so that was uh, another part of the sea change. And, and then as the editor since 2000 of the Canadian Journal for Women in Coaching, um, I have tried, uh, just try. It, it's a commitment, really. Uh, I would be really derelict in, in the opportunities that I've been given if I didn't uh, 
draw attention whenever I've had the opportunity to uh, the plight and the successes of, of women in sport. But I do acknowledge that there have been significant advances uh, and indeed today sport in Canada is barely recognizable from 1975 even as issues continue to hinder genuine quality and, and these let me run through a few of them um, cultural definitions of masculinity and femininity uh, challenges to the existing social order underrepresentation and key decision making in technical positions the perennial work-life balance, which is always a challenge no matter where a woman is on the sports spectrum, uh, particularly if uh, children are involved. Uh, male dominance, even as senior leadership and coaching positions are no, no longer the exclusive preserve of men. Homophobia and the attendant abuses that come with, with homophobia. The lack of mentors, although, uh, and this is a significant change, um, thanks mainly to the work of the Coaching Association of Canada. Mentorship is just, um, how shall I put it? Uh, it? It's become the norm rather than what is that? Um, I think there's still a lack of sufficient support systems, although as we mentioned a few minutes earlier, uh, it, it, communication uh, ha has made it somewhat better. But there's the body image and self-esteem issues that plague so many women in so many areas and and until recently the widely held belief that women's abilities and strength are inferior to those of men. I think that has been disproved um, at least in our world but uh, just last week I did uh, an interview with a woman in Africa, a coach, a former Olympic athlete um, whose mother would not support her uh, desires to be a top ranked runner because she would never be able to have children. Of course, we know that's ridiculous and she does have children, and, but uh, that's now. And so although we've made strides here or in the Western world, um, there's still a lot of women who are held back because of traditional beliefs and I find that worrisome. Um, oh yes, yeah, so let me, uh, one of my, my favorites is uh, an issue that it, it may sound trivial, but to me it never was. And that was working hard to change the way fem female athletes and coaches are reported in the media. And I feel that has had reasonable success. And I did my part by providing interesting and reliable story ideas to key media when I was in a position to do so. And it used to frustrate me until I think it was just last year. Uh, the International Ski Federation finally stopped calling its women athletes ladies. Of course, they didn't call their male athletes gentlemen. And, uh, infuriated me, um, incensed me. Uh, to address that, uh, I wrote a media guide for women athletes and coaches, which was updated two years ago, and that addresses many media issues and uh, is still available. It's a handy little document, not so little, but um, and that was one, one project that was uh, addressed it, changing that sort of portrayal issue. It's no accident that I reached out to you uh, in because you're in communications. I'm in the field of communication as well, and I see so much power and opportunity within uh, media and within writing and communications roles across organizations to, to leverage change love all the work that you've done and thank god you were incensed because it does lead to to real change in language and language matters so much right i know uh, even you know the women athletes i encounter talk about why is it that we're called women athletes that doesn't even make sense we don't call men athletes <laughs> the men athletes doesn't make sense right yeah my daughter's good on picking up on all that kind of stuff can you uh you mentioned yeah, my and how important mentorship mm -hmm. is, but also how prevalent it is nowadays. Can you tell me a bit about your your mentors? You've had huge impact. You mentioned Marion Lay, but who else? Well, I, I'd like to, and if, if it's all right, I'd like to mention uh, a woman who really, I think, set me on the path uh, that I followed, although I would never have known it at the time. Her name was Barbara Prado. She died a number of years ago. 
but when I first met her, I was, um, uh, I'd graduated from university. I had married straight out of university. I had two children. I was desperate to do something more with myself. I didn't know what, and I won't go into the whole scenario, but she came into my environment. She was the executive director of an organ, a national organization that I got involved in really heavily involved in. And what I realized um, along the way is that she was taking me by baby steps. Um, she, she would set me a, a task and I would say to myself, I can't do that. Uh, I've never written an article. I've never done this. I've never done that. You know, like that was what my mindset was because I, I had left university and gone into a very uh, narrow environment, shall we say. And, and so self, self-esteem was not there and all that sort of thing. Um, but so she just, she just very quietly and kindly gave me targets. And because I respected her, I didn't fear her. I, and she was a, a lovely, lovely person. Uh, I trusted her. I guess that's the main thing. Um, I trusted her. So when she set me a task, um, I figured out a way to do it. And just about that same time um, came the opportunity with uh, Canadian Swimming. So she had, through her, her, her mentorship, we didn't use that word, it was a friendship, uh, she saw something in me that she felt was worth nurturing. And I'm always, always grateful to her. And I miss her to this day. Uh, she, she made so many things possible for me. Um, and then when I got to the sports center, um, I have to mention that uh, I would say she was the only female uh, mentor I had. I had male mentors and they were, they made my progression possible. Hugh Glenn, who was at that time the vice president of the, um, of the sports center, uh, found a place for me to, when Champion was in its infancy or just, just an idea and Roger Jackson was supporting it, uh, Hugh Glenn gave me a home. Uh, with uh, with Bill Hirsch at uh, the, um, uh, I keep saying the Athlete Information Bureau, but at that time it was Game Plan Information, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was great. They just they just trusted me to be able to do what I said I wanted to do, and I was again winging it in some ways. I mean, I never I never took unnecessary risks, but if I didn't know how to do something, I figured out quickly how to do it, such as manual layouts, which became uh, something for uh, Bill and I did together, putting Champion, um, you know, before it went to the printing press. I learned a lot from him in so many ways. And then um, coaching association hired a communications person and I was asked to mentor him, uh, which was uh, really quite, quite interesting. That was the late Frank Radcliffe, um, a tremendously witty, excellent, funny person. All these people treated me with as though I was, no, not as though I was. They knew I was capable of what I was wanting to do and they were supportive. Um, Frank later, when I went on my own, mentored me in, the, in that endeavor. So it was, it was all about friendships, really. It comes down to that. And uh, uh, spent some time with Roger uh, last year in Calgary and you know, the old ideas just start churning when you're in a company of people who are, are nurturers. So I was very fortunate. Oh, so great. And you really inspired, I think, the listeners to understand the role and the impact we can play, right? That, yes, we can work in our, in our roles, uh, leveraging the positions we're holding or participating within, but we can also be that support person, be an encourager, but also mentor, to look to others to mentor us and just keep all that conversation flowing. I think it's so crucial. I've got one last question okay. for you, I believe. And it is okay. the big one, you know, what do you think the crux for change might be in sport to achieve greater gender equity, gender balance? What do you think the key is? Yeah, there's um, terminology is changing, but I'd like to, well, I think what I'd like to do is 
begin by acknowledging that today we're talking, all right, 44 years, 45 years later. That's not a long time in the scheme of history. But today, women leaders hold most of the senior leadership positions in Canadian sport. Um, let's list them. Uh, Canadian Olympic Committee's Tricia Smith, who's also an IOC member. Um, on the podiums, Anne Merklinger, who was a national team swimmer and one of Canada's very best curlers. Uh, Coaching Association of Canada's Lorraine Lafreniere, who has held many senior leadership positions. Canadian Paralympic Committee's Karen O'Neill, who always challenged and supported my thinking, sometimes uncomfortably, but always with good results. And the Director General of Sport Canada is also a woman uh, named Vicki Walker. Uh, so that's pretty interesting when you think about it. Um, and, and these women have been in these positions uh, not for a short period of time, but for substantial periods of time, and their influence is powerful. So that's um, interesting in terms of what sport needs to do or can do, or have we already done it? I don't think so. I think we've made great strides, but I also think that gender balance as a term is is too limiting given the things that are happening in the world today. I think it's too narrow for today's world. Uh, to me, the issue is how to achieve equality, diversity, and inclusivity. If anything of the events of the past year uh, south of us and, and at home too, we must become complacent. Um, if, if we've learned anything, it's that there's, it's a multifaceted dilemma. It's not just about gender. And I don't think we can have gender balance uh, if sport denies access to black, indigenous and transgen transgender women, for example. Uh, I, I know that there's plenty of black women athletes in Canada who have done amazingly well and are excellent role models. But if we, just, if we could just generalize, it has to be a welcoming environment. And I can't claim to speak for any of those groups because I'm not part of them. So I have to listen carefully to what they have to say. And I think what's required is a broadening of the quest for gender balance to include gender diversity and gender inclusivity. I think it's become clear that income inequality contributes to the problem. And girls and women who cannot access sport because it is not affordable are excluded. And who knows like what the impact of that's going to be uh, during and after this, this pandemic. So I think a culturally and ethnic, sorry, ethnically welcoming environment is essential. I think we have to change our approach. Outstanding. And I know Carolyn Trono, another fabulous rower who's doing great work in Sport for Life for oh. welcoming refugee families right into sport as a pathway into community. Love it. Love it. Yeah, Love no, it. she's a good that's a she's a great example. Yeah, she is. And so modest. Well, thank you so much. Sheila, this has been fabulous. You've given me a whole uh, history of sport in Canada and women in sport in Canada as well, their trajectory. Uh, you give me hope and optimism <laughs> and uh, we'll be working on this and I'd love to keep staying in touch. You've been uh, yes, such please. an integral member of our sport landscape and community. And I want to thank you for all the work that you've done. And, and you've definitely, I often talk to people about mentorship sometimes is more like stalking where I think I've just kind of stalked you. You don't know you're mentoring me, but you are. <laughs> and so many yeah. others. <laughs> Absolutely. Very kind. Thank you. I've enjoyed, I always enjoy talking with you, Jennifer. And I, I would like to say that the work you do is, is vital. And uh, I'm happy to even make a, a small contribution to this current project of yours. Thank you so much. And we'll be uh, pulling this together into an, an edited version, of course, and sharing the webinar on all our channels. And, and we hope that everybody shares it widely. Some great messages for our listeners, great messages for people who are working in the realm of sport to be keeping in mind uh, concepts that will be inclusive more generally. I love that final definition of of our efforts really is to broaden that, that our scope right to be inclusive in all ways and i think some of the challenges women have faced of course apply to so many people in our population so we're carving a path for so many 
thanks so much. Have a great day in the snow. <laughs> and we'll be <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Bye. Thanks.